So today we're going to continue our discussion on the cellular level of organization, and specifically focus on the cytoplasm and the nucleus. As always, make sure you're able to execute these learning objectives before you continue to the next lecture. Okay, so there's four main things on the agenda today. And the first thing I want to talk about is something called the cytosol. And what the cytosol really is, is it's the fluid inside the cell. So it's the intracellular fluid. And it's composed mostly of water, uh, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and other inorganic molecules. The second thing we want to focus on is something that is termed a category that's termed the cytoplasmic organelle category. And these are specialized structures within the cell that do something. So whenever we talk about an organelle, it's a you know, broad category, and it's a membrane-bound uh, membrane structure inside the cell that has some specialized or specific function. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few of these. So this is a nice schematic of a generalized cell. Uh, you see a bunch of organelles all over the cells. Uh, the ones I'm going to focus on today, I'm going to sort of highlight for you so you can take note of those. And I want you to think of them in categories. If we think of these as, you know, 20 or 30 random terms, it's very difficult to remember what they do. But if we think of them in categories or groups that go together, I think it helps uh, with the learning process. So the first category are organelles that are involved in protein synthesis. And here I'm really going to highlight three. So there's free ribosomes floating in the nucleus, excuse me, in the cytoplasm. Uh, there's also something called rough endoplasmic reticulum that sort of, you know, starts the protein synthesis. And then there's uh, something called the Golgi complex that puts final modifications on the proteins uh, towards the end of protein synthesis. So whenever you think about protein synthesis, I'd encourage you to think of these big three. The next thing we want to think about is the demolition crew. So in other words, there's always waste products in the cell, just like, uh, you know, the garbage truck drives by your house each week or your apartment each week to pick up the garbage. Uh, you know, we have to do that, otherwise we'd have problems, right? We'd have rats accumulating, stuff like that. Uh, in the cell, we have metabolic waste, and we have to get rid of these metabolic wastes, otherwise we're going to have major problems within the cell too, and the cell will actually uh, undergo either mal you know, misfunction or, or malfunction, or it'll undergo uh, cell death. So there's the demolition crew. And there's two organ organelles here I want to speak of. So there's something called a lysosome and something called a peroxisome. And both of these are involved in destroying uh, sort of old uh, metabolic waste products. So breaking down old lipids, uh, amino acids, carbohydrates, you know, any of the macromolecules, things of that nature. Uh, some of them are even involved in uh, breaking down um, the byproducts of reactive oxygen species, which result through metabolic waste. And whenever you have problems with these structures, it leads to something, or it can lead to many things actually, but it can lead specifically to something called Tay-Sachs. And I highlight that, highlight that here on the right. Uh, it's a disease, there's a lot of neurological conditions, and it results uh, because of problems in breaking down the waste products of the cell. Okay, the third category I'm going to speak of here is the powerhouse, or the energy of the cell. Where does the cell get its energy from? And here specifically, we're going to highlight the mitochondria. So you see that on the bottom right. Mitochondrion is singular, that's one. Mitochondria is plural, that's many. And really the mitochondria are these double membrane structures that really help produce energy for the cell. Uh, it's really neat. Uh, it sort of shows the unity of life and how life has played off itself, uh, symbiosis, if you will. So um, about 40 years ago, maybe, um, a scientist by the name of Lynn Margulis came about uh, a theory called the endosymbiotic theory. And what it says is these mitochondria, you see right here, highlighted in red, are really double membrane structures that are former bacteria that at one point a eukaryotic cell engulfed and, um, and became reliant upon and it produced energy for the cell. So really mitochondria are, are former bacteria that our cells are now reliant upon and they have their own DNA and they replicate independently of the DNA within the nucleus. So it's really sort of a neat phenomenon. Okay, the third category, uh, proteins that are involved in support and scaffolding. So which ones are these? Okay, so these are called the cytoskeleton, and specifically there's three different kinds. There's microtubules that are involved in chromosome division. Uh, there's microfilaments, right, that are involved in the cell splitting. And there's intermediate filaments that sort of line the inside of the nucleus. Uh, there's many of them, but one of them called lamin inside, lines the inside of the nucleus. And it's involved in uh, many things like DNA replication, uh, transcription, uh, as well as support. So, so the cytoskeleton itself actually does more than just support and scaffolding that I have listed on the right, though that is its main function. And then finally, what anchors um, the cell for cell division? Uh, these structures over here called centrosomes. And so when the microtubules are reaching out and latching onto chromosomes to separate them during cell division, the centrosomes here, uh, which you see over here, they're really um, the anchors for these microtubules at the poles of the, of the cell.
I gave you a quick overview of the different organelles that you see in a eukaryotic cell. Uh, specifically, uh, you know, we're focusing more on like an animal cell. Uh, but you really do need to read the book on this. So keep in mind that you really want to look all these terms over and make sure you understand them. Uh, one thing in particular, you want to make sure you understand what a eukaryotic cell is, right? So a eukaryotic cell is a cell that relies or that has a membrane-bound nucleus that you see over here. Uh, prokaryotic cells do not have a membrane-bound nucleus. And we'll speak about that more uh, later in this lecture. Okay, so that gives you a feeling for the different organelles that are in the cell. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about things called, they're called cytoplasmic inclusions. And really what these are, these are temporary structures. So I just want to sort of mention that they're temporary. And they're things like lipid droplets to store fat. And they're also things like uh, glycosomes to store sugar or carbohydrates. Uh, just as in anatomy, or anatomy comes from the ancient Greek from the Latin, a lot of terms in biology in general uh, come from Greek or Latin. And so here we see the word glyco. Uh, glyco or glyco. Glyco in Greek means uh, sweet or you know sugary. And so that's why whenever you see glyco anything, you're talking about carbohydrates. Okay, finally, let's talk about the nucleus. So we're going to spend a decent amount of time on this. So we'll talk about the nucleus and the role that it plays. Remember, eukaryotic cells have a membrane-bound nucleus that holds the genetic information, the DNA. Prokaryotic cells just have their uh, DNA in a general region called the nucleoid region. Okay, so what is the overall structure of the nucleus? Let's take a look at it here. So the nucleus itself is double membraned and it has a, something called a nuclear envelope. Uh, it also has things called nuclear pores. You'll see those and we sort of blew up one of these nuclear pores on the right here. And so the nuclear pores are really allowing uh, transport of materials, you know, back and forth, um, you know, uh, from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And we'll talk about those a little bit later on, but they're allowing, you know, transport of those types of materials. Okay. Uh, something else we want to talk about here is that within the nucleus, we have this smaller structure called a nucleolus. And this is really involved in uh, producing ribosomes that are involved in protein synthesis. Also within the nucleus, you'll see that we have, and you can barely see it actually, uh, we have the genetic information, right? I have this in the sort of bottom of the slide here. Uh, throughout the nucleus, you'll have chromosomes. I'll just draw some in here. At uh, different stages in the cell cycle, we call them either chromatin or chromosomes, and we'll talk about the difference a little bit later. Uh, but really, when we think of nucleus, that's what we think of, DNA, right, the genetic information. We'll talk about how that, uh, you know, sort of um, plays out over time and how that expresses itself. Okay, so when we talk about eukaryotic cells, it's an important thing to keep in mind when we talk about anatomy. Um, so there's a good background for that topic. When we talk about eukaryotic cells, really what we're talking about is uh, we have DNA inside the nucleus. We have to think of how is that DNA packaged? And really for two reasons. So one reason when you think of how is it packaged, one reason is really saying, you know, how does it fit, right? How does it possibly fit? But then the second reason is, you know, more of a, a higher level reason. How does the packaging allow for expression of genes? And that's sort of an important thing to think of. Whenever we talk about someone having a gene expressed that's beneficial or a gene that's expressed as deleterious, that's not beneficial, we really want to think of the fact that it's not just enough for the gene to be there. If it's going to do something good or bad, right, it has to express. It has to produce uh, either RNA and then possibly even protein, ultimately, from that gene. So let's take a look at how DNA is uh, packaged here. So the first thing we're talking about is we have uh, something called the naked DNA structure, or the DNA double helix. And the width of that double helix is about two nanometers. It's the most basic uh, structure of DNA. Uh, there's no extra wrapping here beyond the wrapping you see. And so really we call that naked DNA or bare DNA. It's the term we use. If you go up a little bit further here, uh, you'll notice that the DNA starts to wind around these spheres. The sphere itself is something called the nucleosome core, and it's made out of eight proteins that are called histone proteins. The DNA wraps around that to form something called the nucleosome, right, called the nucleosome. Once you slap on another histone here, and this, excuse me, this histone here would be this one right here, uh, then it's something that we call a chromatosome, a higher level, level structure here. And overall, you'll see you get this sort of architecture, the structure looks like beads on a string. And really, that's what you call it in the scientific literature. You'll call it beads on a string. The width of one of these nucleosomes or one of these chromatosomes uh, is about 11 nanometers. And then you get further folding after that. So the beads on a string themselves fold further, and you see you get this thicker filament called a 30 nanometer fiber. And then after that, you get higher levels as well. Uh, ultimately, you get to the point where you have a full-blown chromosome. Uh, and that's a chromosome in metaphase that you see there. 
Uh, but really, I'm going to stop the discussion right here, right? So 30 and under, we're sort of sticking there because that's where we really understand how this folding takes place. And the important thing about this to realize is that if we have a gene on DNA, let's say there's a gene like, let me change my color just so you could sort of uh, really see this here. So let's, let's make it sort of yellowish. Okay, if you have a gene right here, if that gene is tightly bound within that nucleosome, so the DNA is really tightly wound around the, that uh, protein sphere, that gene's not going to be able to express. However, if that protein sphere sort of opens up and loosens, then the DNA can express. So you can see that's where we really get to that second important factor here, that yeah, the packaging helps us fit the DNA in the nucleus, but a little more importantly is the fact that it allows for expression of genes or inhibition or stopping of the expressing of the gene. Okay, so let's look a little bit more uh, as far as these, uh, these histones here, just so you can see how they're formed. So the way they're formed is you have four different histones within the core. You have an H3, you have an H4, you have an H2A, and an H2B. Uh, don't get bogged down with the names. The names are just the names. Uh, a lot of times you might think, where do they get these names from? Where are these numbers coming from? Often they're, uh, when you have any type of macromolecule or cell or anything like that, if they have these weird numbering systems, Either they're um, being numbered in the order in which people think they evolved, or they're being numbered in the order in which they were discovered, or possibly the order in which they occur in a given, a given um, uh, biological pathway. So anyway, bottom line is don't get too confused about those numbers. You want to know them. You want to know the names, right? H3, H4, H2A, H2B. But, you know, don't let that confuse you. We could have just called them, you know, uh, the purple protein or the green protein, you know. Okay, so that being said, Within a sphere, you have those four. So within this sphere here, you have these four over here. And the thing you want to realize is that you have two of each of these four, right? So I'll put sort of times two there, right? So you have two H3s, you have two H4s, two H2A, two H2B. And then what happens basically is they form this way. You have H3 and H4 coming to form a dimer, H2A to H2B forming a dimer. Dimer just means two, right? There's those two together. The two dimers of each form tetramers, right? One's shown here, the other one's not shown. And ultimately, they come together to give you a histone octamer. And that's where you get eight. Remember, octo in Greek means eight, right? So within this structure right here, within that nucleosome core, you have eight different uh, proteins. Okay, when you slap on that extra protein that I showed in the last slide, here I'm giving it an identity. It's called the H1 protein. Now you have something called the chromatosome. Okay, this is just sort of a nice uh, little model of that showing it to you. And the thing I want to emphasize on this model that we didn't talk about previously is you'll see these little extensions coming off of this nucleosome core. See an extension there, an extension here, an extension here. These extensions are called tails. So they're called tails, right? So they're called tails. Excuse the sloppy handwriting, so that's tails <laughs> uh, in cursive. Uh, okay, so, so they're tails. And what that does is those tails, think of them as arms reaching out and grabbing the DNA or loosening the DNA. So we talk about the DNA being compact or not, those tails are what are doing that job. So they're the ones that are allowing expression or lack of expression. And modification of those tails are things that um, can um, influence whether or not they bind tightly or not. Uh, a lot of events in your lifetime, uh, it's sort of interesting, um, a lot of events in your lifetime can affect how compact or how loose a given gene is around a given nucleosome core. So for example, exercise has shown, shown to uh, increase the expression of genes that are beneficial for individuals, uh, whereas overeating has shown uh, to uh, decrease expression of genes that are beneficial or even increase expression of genes that are harmful. So these are things that can be affected. Uh, we don't have a full understanding of it at this day and age. You know, we have a few examples we can throw out, but not a ton. But as, um, as the field um, elaborates even further or expands even further, I think we'll find out a lot more modifications that are manipulated by lifestyle, diet, you know, things of that nature. Okay, if we talk about the nuts and bolts of the structure of DNA. So we have DNA has four letters, right? Four repeating units. So you have an A, um, adenine, you have a G, guanine, you have a T, thymine, and a C, cytosine. You only have four bases that lead to all this diversity that you see when you look around, um, you know, humanity or look around um, the animal kingdom in general. It's really, really quite interesting when you think about it. Uh, and really, it's the order of these letters that lead to diversity. So A always pairs with T through hydrogen bonding, and G always pairs with C through hydrogen bonding. Uh, you'll notice that the DNA helix is a double helix, right? And there's uh, two phosphate backbones that are wound around each other. Here's one phosphate backbone. Here's the other phosphate backbone. And those two backbones have the letters on the inside, right? The bases on the inside. 
and they're held together by hydrogen bonds, as I mentioned. Uh, linking the bases and the phosphate backbone, backbone excuse me, is something called a uh, deoxyribose uh, sugar, sugar molecule. Okay, so what does DNA do? So really when we think of DNA, uh, DNA is something that can be used to make proteins. We don't always have to go all the way to the level of the protein, but you know, for an intro course, it's easiest to explain it as the goal of having a gene is to make a protein, right? That's not always true, but you know, in general, that's, that's the main function. And so it's amazing to get all that diversity, right? So the human genome has about 30,000 genes. Uh, this number is always changing. So when I was in school, they said 50,000, then they went on to 10, now they're at 30. But it gives you a general idea, you know, of the number of genes. Uh, and then each of those genes can produce different proteins, and those proteins can be spliced different ways. So you can get a ton of proteins, right? Up to a million different types of proteins. So here's something that's very important, big take home point of this lecture, right? So there's something called the central dogma of molecular biology. And the central dogma states this, you start with DNA. DNA is transcribed, so that's a process, right? Transcription to something called messenger RNA. That happens in the nucleus. Then that messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and it is translated into proteins. And that process of translation happens in the cytoplasm. Finally, we have proteins. Proteins are the things or the macromolecules in the cell that do things, right? They're the players. I think of DNA as sort of, um, I don't know, like if you think of a medieval time, like a king or queen in his or her castle. Uh, too important to leave because if they get killed, the whole kingdom is done, right? Sort of making this up. Uh, but they're shouting out directions, right? So they're giving directions to their scribes. The scribes are the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA are leaving the castle. The castle would be the nucleus, right? And then they're giving orders to their generals and their soldiers. Uh, those would be the proteins. And that shouting out of orders is called translation. So you really want to understand this process here. Again, it's called the central dogma of molecular biology. Okay, this shows you the exact same thing I showed you on the last slide, but gives you sort of a spatial recognition of it. So uh, I won't spend too much on time on this slide, but I want you to see where these processes take place. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, transcription is happening in the nucleus, translation is happening in the cytoplasm. Okay, so these are the four things we talked about today. We talked about cytosol, cytoplasmic organelles, um, cytoplasmic inclusions in the nucleus. Gives you a, a general idea of the cellular level of organization when we talk in regards to the cytoplasm and the nucleus. As always, make sure that you understand these learning objectives before you proceed to the next lecture. If you're able to execute these, you're ready to go. If you can't execute or conduct those three things there, if you can't do those, please make sure you watch the lecture again uh, or see me for assistance.